All right, we're here with uh, the great Kamal Kenyatta. Thank you, sir, for uh, for doing this, and uh, I'm stoked to have you here. Man, I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, you know, so like I was telling you, kind of beforehand, uh, what I've been doing with these podcasts, and just to kind of shed light on the you know people I find interesting, things that I like, um, stuff that I think other people might like, you know. So. It's kind of, it's an honor to, to get to talk with you. You know, you're kind of, for me in SD, you're kind of one of those, like, I don't know, you're just one of those like mythical dudes that I kind of see around sometimes. And <laughs> so you're very intriguing to me, mm. but, um, you know, and you know, I just have kind of known you over the years, I guess. And, uh, you know, got to talk, you know, sit down and, and chat with you and you've come to the jam and then come to the, you know, the studio down in East Lake we were talking about it earlier. So, um, you know, it's been cool to kind of watch, watch what I've seen kind of progress, you know, what you've been doing, whether it's with, you know, you, I just feel like you're with so many different artists. You're kind of, you know, you're producing so much stuff, whether it's with Gregory Porter, or, uh, Alicia, is that her name? Alicia? Yeah. Alicia. O- o- Alicia. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I've been seeing some of that stuff, uh, just online or however, you know, whatever medium, but so you're always, in, you know, you're one of those guys that's always doing something. So it's cool. But uh, what are you up to now, man? You you were telling me you were doing some some big band stuff with uh, I think a Trump. I can't remember his name. Yeah, his name is Chris Johnson. Chris um, Johnson. Okay. He's from um, he's from my hometown. A prominent uh, trumpet player and arranger in the Detroit area. And I met him because I used to play. You know, when you when you do this long enough, you start getting into second and third generation. So his uncle and I used to play together in the seventies and. Um, his uncle Mark uh, is a pianist who uh, played with Miles Davis um, on some of the electric stuff, wow. and also the uh, the brothers Johnson and others. He was really, really a, one of the strong piano players out of Detroit uh, from my generation. And um, anyway, so th- so I met Chris, and you know, this family has multi generational talent. Mm. And um, I saw I saw an arrangement that Chris did of Wayne Shorter's Yes or No, a very fresh, very contemporary take on that. And he's doing it with a virtual big band. Um, and, you know, I had the chance to commission him to do some some of my songs the same way. And I'm really proud of the results. So whenever you think it's appropriate, we got to share one of those so people can. Check okay, it out. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would love to check that out. Um, you can pull it up if you want. Sure. I think that would be okay. great. Okay, I'll share it right now. And um, here we go.
Yes. That's great. Thank you so much. I man. love I it, man. Oh. I've been, when I was, man, I love that. When I was getting my master's, I was playing the big band again. And it, and it just like, I forgot how cool big band is. Right. See, like um, I for, you forget. And especially, and I just love how you did it virtual. Just, I just love like the technology we have now. And like, you just, the guy's just sitting there with his, you know, his rig, just rolling, playing drum. Like, I love it. I just think it's cool how you can see all that. And I mean, uh, if you, if you listen to that without the video, if you just hear it, mm -hmm. I don't think most listeners would even detect that it was, you know, pieced together because we start in a DAW, we do a dummy track in, in logic, mm -hmm. send it to the first chair players. So the first trumpet plays, the first trombone plays, and then the other horns match to that. Of so I mean, it's, it's yeah. really an involved process. And yet I think, um, we don't get we don't get over caught up in the technology of it. I mean, it's, it's still about the sound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Chris and I, Chris does the arranging, but you know, I, I'm an editor, so, so I, I work with him. Most of the great uh, musicians I, I work with, um, I, you know, I help, I, I typically simplify what they, what they give me. And, mm -hmm. and that is, that's kind of an edited version of some of his ideas. I mean, this guy is, but he has more than enough, and he does that deliberately. He gives me something, you know, to choose from. Mm. And um, I'm, uh, we, we're going to do, we have um, four finished now. The latest one is going to premiere really soon, and it features the vibraphone player Sasha Berliner, if you know her from Northern Cal. Okay. She's now in New York. Fantastic. I, I, she must be 25, 26. And um, I feel like at this part of my life and my career, I should be you know, uh, really helping expose the world to what younger people are doing. They asked me to play in that thing. Man. I was like, no, man. <laughs> the, the piano player in there, her name is Arco Iris uh, Sandoval. Uh, she, I think she's from New Mexico. She lives in New York. She's one of the top players there. I met her on another project, and I was just, I love her playing. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to be like everybody's dad in the middle of the video or something, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I, I like the way the video looks. I mean, that's people from uh, Los Angeles. You, you probably noticed uh, Dr. David Castaneda. Oh yeah, you know, I saw him. <laughs> who now lives in San Diego. Um, and he did that, uh, he did his part at Rarified. Oh, I thought recorded. that looked familiar, yeah. Yeah, that's Rarified. And uh, we have New Yorkers in the video. We have some people in Utah and a lot of Detroit because that's where Chris and I are from. So, um, and it, I just, I love the look and the interaction and um, I'm very proud. It's, I'm very, very proud of this stuff. I think it's great, man. I really, I love it. I, I love how you made it a, a whole work too. It's like, it's more than just, you know, a big man playing a tune. It's like you captured the whole thing and you put it on YouTube and it's there. It's like, and I love it. Like I'm all about, I mean, obviously I love this kind of stuff. That's what we're doing right now, but mm -hmm. I really like how you're doing that. I think like that, I think that's the next gener. you know, this is like the next thing for, you know, music and just the world. Like obviously everything's digitized now, you know, and there's good thing and bad things about it. But I think it's cool how, you know, this project you're doing, you know, you said you got four of them done. We, we've got four done and we have plans for six. I, I just gave him, I'm so excited. I'm commissioning, commissioning him to do two more uh, in January. And, you know, people, and I, I know a lot of musicians that are watching are probably concerned, like, how do you monetize this? I mean, if you give all this stuff and it's, it's there, it's on YouTube mm -hmm. and, you know, um, guess what? Through some of the work that, that he and I have done together, He's now going to be doing something um, in Detroit um, at a high-end ven uh, venue arranging for Terrence Blanchard. Oh, wow. Because one of the things we posted, you know, Terrence was in like, hey, this, this is good. I like See, the composition. I like the arrangement. Mm -hmm. So good things happen when people work together. And I love how you said that, man, because like, I, I think I was saying this, you know, off air before we started with you. But I really love that, that networking ability especially through because of the internet and because of this technology we have it's like it's a it's a new game now you know what i mean and it's like i love that you know a video like that you're able to capture something you can make this this little piece of art and now it's fully formed in the sense that there's visuals anyone can see it 
you can access it on a phone or wherever I can pull it up on this screen. It's like, you can't do that with a real, you know, in a real setting in, in a live situation, which is different. Not that that's not, that's not good, but I just, I love how you're able to take, take advantage of that. And you see that potential in that. Cause some people don't, don't really see that. And, you know, and they ask, you know, well, how, how are you going to monetize this? Like, how does this mm -hmm. work? Like, how do you, if you're just like, just like you said, it's like, well, yeah, you're right. But you're also, you also have to think of it in a different way. You know, it's not, it's not how it was. And, and, and because of this networking ability, like you're saying now, this, now this kid's going to arrange for Terrence Blatcher because he saw, you know, he saw this and he thought it was cool, whatever it is, but it's like, right. That and we didn't send, we didn't send it to Blanchard. Right, like he found us. So it's know? almost an organic find. Yeah. See, yeah. And, and that and that's part of the culture now. Like whether you like it or not, that is part of the culture. And and honestly, I think it's I think it's great. It, I think it's it's empowering. And it's like it, it's like if you you know I mean we've been waiting as musicians. I feel like historically we've been waiting our all our whole lives for this. Like <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It's like now we can finally we can finally grab onto something and like control it and, and reach directly to people and, and not have to go through, you know, record companies or unless you want to, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the guy to talk to about that, but it's nice. It's nice to be able to like, see how you can interact directly and create this new, this new thing. And like, you see it and it's, I think it's cool, man. That's why I like you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank but, you so much. Man. But man, that, that was a great, that's a great tune and, and that arrangement, man. So how you were talking about, you like to simplify, like as an editor, most of the time you're just simplifying with these, these great artists. Like how, how do you approach something like that? Or how, I feel like that's kind of your gift because yeah, you, you're good um, at that. Yeah. Well, you know, I've had to, I've had to, that's, that's probably the wrong way. I have worked. <laughs> You know, with all these great musicians, uh, uh, Billy Childs, for instance, on piano. Wow. Uh, Christian Sands on piano. And here I am, like, asking them to do something, right? And I am not the pianist <laughs> that that uh, Billy Childs is or, or Christian Sands. You know, like, I, I, of course not. I mean, but the point is, when you get a reputation for kind of knowing what you're doing and and also being sincere like in mm -hmm. other words whenever i ask something of a musician that i'm working with be it an arranger or a pianist a drummer it's not because i'm i'm not like flossing i'm not like showing what i know at all I'm, i put the the project ahead of myself always and i think um, anyone that's worked with me knows that about me so i can ask these great musicians you know christian this time when you do the solo, make sure you play it in the upper register because it'll cut through the orchestra more. Mm. And it's like, there's no question, like, no, I like the last take I did. It's just, okay, here it is. You know, Billy Childs, this note in the chord, let, let's not use that note, that note in the, in the chord. Um, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a voicing. It was more that he had a, a, a repetition that I thought might be distracting from the vocal. Mm. There was no, I mean, there was no, this great, great musician, this great pianist, great composer, great arranger, you know, they're, they're more like, man, good catch kind of thing. Yeah, and that's, you get a, I think when you have a reputation for uh, sincerity mm -hmm. and also um, the primacy of the artist or the project and not, I'm never there to like show Kamau Kenyatta. I mean, that's ridiculous. I'm, I'm there to serve the artist that I produce and... Um, as an editor, you mentioned editing, and people don't. One of the things I always tell students and younger musicians is that a recording is not a live performance. Mm. It sounds too like simple, but no, you can you have a chance to make a recording sound different mm. or, or 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 change things. Um, you can tune things. You can change. You can change pitches. You can you can leave things out, and a good editor you'd never know that they had done any of it. In fact, I defy um, any of the, these great solos and great musicians that I've worked with to go back and find what I changed. But I'm always making changes. And sometimes, sometimes solos, like I work with a great uh, harmonica player, Gregoire Marais, and Gregoire will send seven takes of a single cut. And then I'll do a composite from that but I don't, you know, you shouldn't be able to tell that I did anything. You know, I want to be, 
I want to kind of be invisible as a contributor, but make the project, uh, make the soloists maybe find their in an intent that they didn't even know. Or, um, you know, I'm always trying to reveal the artist's uh, vision. Um, working with Gregory is a very different thing than working with the Brazilian uh, composer, Ed Mota. You know, one is organic, one is like super prepared, and the results from both are incredible. But I, as a producer, has to, I have to be very, very flexible, and I have to be transparent, and I have to like morph in front of my own eyes to serve the, the needs of the different artists. Right. I see what you're saying. It's very individualistic for where, what that project is and what, what you're trying to achieve like uh, artistically or whatever, whatever you're trying to make. Mm -hmm. So I get what you're saying. It's, it's interesting like that, that you've kind of honed it as a skill though. Yeah. You know, and I never, I didn't start, I'm like all of us. I wanted to be a player. I mean, of course, I wanted to play the saxophone. I wanted to play the <laughs> piano, and I wanted I wanted to be really, really great at it. And I must say, I, I mean, by default, I started, you know, doing uh, production. You know, maybe making decisions that other musicians uh, didn't want to make. And um, I have to credit Gregory Porter um, for for really being the one who kind of brought me to the forefront as a producer. Mm. Because everyone asked me, everyone asked me, well, are, are you playing with him? And, you know, I have played with him, you know, many times. And even, you know, as he's ascended as a star, I've had a few chances to play with him. But what I do for him is in the studio. What mm -hmm. I do is, you know, it's like a producer and, uh, you know, an idea person for him. And, you know, it's this little older guy protecting this big, you know, <laughs> you know younger guy. You know, I, I, I. You know, I'm his bodyguard, maybe musically sometimes, and, right. and and I like that role. Yeah, I get you. That's interesting. I mean, the the whole your whole relationship with Gregory Porter. When I found out that you were kind of a part, like you had helped produce all that stuff, I was like, what? Mm -hmm. Like, I know who Gregory Porter is. I love that guy. <laughs> so I was kind of mm -hmm. you were kind of like my like my little local star here because I, mm -hmm. I I thought it was great. You know, some of those songs are, I, I love those albums, man. I, I have every single one. So yeah, I, his, so, his songwriting, I mean, first of all, is if all he did was sing like that. Right, that, yeah, for it'd real. Be, it'd be way more than enough. But <laughs> his songwriting um, is, I think, what separates him the most from other artists. And, and uh, you know, the, he kind of, at a time when we need empathy and sincerity, mm -hmm. he, he really, really uh, brings it in a unique way. And... You know, he's such an interesting person, you know, beyond music. I mean, he's a very charismatic person and really high intellect. I mean, you could bring up anything and he's probably been reading about it, you know, mm. in, in his own way, in his own time. Right. And, and he's very, very informed um, about almost anything. Ed Mota is like that, too. They're they're both like and they're so different because Ed Mota is like very exacting and very uh, detail oriented and Gregory hates detail. Okay. He, he, he sees, he sees things on like a, some higher, deeper artistic plane and then lets other people deal with it. And I mean, we can see what the results are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his music exudes all those characteristics you're talking about. I mean, I feel like you can't help but notice all those things. At least I couldn't. Yeah, I mean, as a songwriter, man, there's there's so much to learn from him. I mean, first of all, it, it's all authentic. I mean, that that take me take me to the alley, right. um, a song that we 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 won a Grammy for in in 2016. You know, it's about his mother. You know, it, but it's this composite between this Christ-like figure and his mother, who was a, an itinerant uh, minister. Just you know, and she was the kind of person who. Um, the more people needed, the more she gave. So Gregory would say when he came home from to, from uh, school, in middle school and, and, and high school, um, there'd be eight people in his house he didn't know. <laughs> and they they would be addicts and, and street people and prostitutes. And the mom would feed them. And, you know, and Gregory would say, you know, stuff would end up missing. And, right. But none of that mattered to his mother. His mother just kept giving to people who needed uh, needed her. And that's what this this whole idea of this this transcendent figure comes back 
and um, the, 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 everyone thinks they want to be shown royalty and and right. They they want to go to the alley. They, they want, want to go, go to, to the, the worst pe- parts. Yeah. Yes, and that's that's where the so. But this song has a a base in reality, and yet he has that beautiful way. Like, I mean, you can see it in many many things. Like, for instance, uh, c- cinema from Latin America often has like reality and fantasy, and the the line is so it's, like yeah, it's blurred. It's so blurry, yeah. and so he. You know, he, he has enough reality that you can grasp things, and yet he still uses his imagination. Mm-hmm. So the the character isn't just his mom. You know, it's a composite character, and he uses also, that technique right. in a lot of his songwriting. There's a song about abused women on the first album called The Lonely One, and mm. uh, that's that. not one woman. It's several women who've told their stories of abuse to him. And he he makes it one person. Right. I mean, he's he's brilliant, man. Come on. I was just listening I, to uh, I was just listening to uh, no uh, no love dying. Is that the right title? Yes. I love that song. I was just showing one of my students it. For some reason, it popped in my head, and I was like, "Wait, you have you ever heard Greg Porton?" He's like, "No." I was like, "Oh no, let me pull this up." So I pulled it up and showed it to him, and I I made him try and figure it out by ear. I was like, "Try and figure <laughs> it out right now. Like, what what is he playing? What keys he in?" <laughs> but I oh, love. Wow. It's a great song, man. Man, you know what's funny? Um, when the last time I worked with him in in June, we did five songs for an album that's going to be released in in November, and we redid "No Love Dying," oh. and with um, with singers from the Black Church. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. And, and it's it is amazing. I wish I had the permission to like play it now. No, that's all maybe, right. I can wait. After November, we'll. <laughs> um, but uh, it's funny. Now, this is a thing. This is a real thing. So Gregory was like, we're going to redo a few songs. We're going to do some new songs. But he hadn't conceptualized exactly how he was going to change the songs. Okay. So I said, I said, Black Church. And he said. So it's going to be like a gospel choir type type thing? Like it's, we, we use three incredible singers okay. uh, to create a choir. Okay. You know, uh, by by overdubbing, and um, but I mean it happened in typical Greg Reporter fashion, completely organically. Like a f- you know a few weeks before the 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 session, I say, hey, let's why don't we do this? Because this song already has the it's it's, it's anthemic, isn't it? Yeah, of course, yeah. And and so let's let's bring and and of course when you hear what he, how he sings on this, oh, I just got goosebumps, man. I can't wait. I, you know, so it's uh, it's a really, and we also added organ, and it, I think it's a really okay. Really see, now you're organ. speaking to me because I, I've been playing at my my church gig. Mm-hmm. It's it's just like this God. They're non denominational, but it, you know, it's it's a black church. It's gospel. It's like a straight up gospel music, and you know, I I have been playing there for a while now. It's probably been like ten years or plus, probably I don't know how long, but uh, I have just kind of fallen in love with that music, man. I've learned so many songs. And I just got to play with uh, Norman Hutchins, mm-hmm. who is like a great, uh, he's just like a classic. I love all his music. So it was just kind of, I was kind of starstruck to be able to like kind of get to talk to him. <laughs> you know, like, and the level of, the level of musicianship in the, in the black church. is absolutely uh, uh, like insane. It's, it's so much so like. Right. I mean, and, and that's vocally and instrumentally. And it is really kind of um, an academy in the culture. You know, and and I, I, I don't know if I'll get in trouble for this comparison, but mm-hmm. I feel like uh, I've seen the same thing in in mariachis like this man. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I know some mariachis like they'll play the hell out of some tune and then hand the instrument off and they're they're on a different instrument yeah, on the yeah. next tune. I can see they that. know all the songs in whatever key, key like yep. someone will just start and you have and that's very much like a secular version of the black church mm-hmm. i mean if we want to call it like secular no, I, get what you're I, saying. I, I mean to me it's i feel them all, all like the same way right but, yeah i agree yeah uh but those places man ugh, the level of musicianship is crazy i'm gonna be honest man i i think i learned the most i've probably ever learned was from getting this you know playing in this in this setting every week you know what mm-hmm. i mean and like having to swim in deep water, just, I mean, there's no music, like, they're right. Not, they're not, they're not, I mean, they're yelling numbers at you if, when they do. <laughs> right. You better hear it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's without a doubt. And honestly, it's, it's given, it's like, I've learned 
so much from just that now that, you know, when I, and I, and I could tell, I could tell that's like, you know, I love, I love jazz music, you know, and whatever that is, that's a huge umbrella, but I love all that stuff. And to see, I could see so many similarities in it just by the Mm -hmm. way they play. And like, I don't know from what I've historically have been able to kind of dig up on the music. It's like, it's, it, they're, they're, they're the same thing really in a sense. And it's like, yeah. I, I tell the, I tell them all the time because I've kind of I've like met all these San Diego gospel musicians and they're all kind of my friends now just from seeing them around and you know and uh, you know there's some people that I really admire that are just one of a kind and like when they sit down and play it's just like I try and tell some of my my jazz friends you know like hey guys you got to meet these people and vice versa I always tell all the gospel dudes I'm like man the minute you guys decide to play anything besides gospel music like we don't stand a chance <laughs> man i i know man i i i had uh the neighborhood i grew up in the inner city in detroit um there was a church on the corner and it it was um you know one of those small churches with where they you know got the spirit and and the pianist went to my high school and i knew him and one day he came by for breakfast and uh you know, he his whole life centered around the church. Mm-hmm. He wasn't. It's not. It was probably a little different than it is today. Like, uh, I think there's more cross cross pollinization now, and you know, people going to YouTube and listening to whatever. No, this guy knew church music, and I played. I just said, Bill. His name was Bill Brown. I played some Art Tatum for him. Um, at the house, just just I don't know why. I just wanted to play Art Tatum for Bill Brown. And Bill was one of those heavy, heavy church players. And he was like, you know, a country guy from the South. He's like, oh, that's nice. That's so nice. And then he just went to the piano and started playing. playing some of this ta- <laughs> Cause he hears but, it. He just, he, and, and I, that's so funny you say that because that's the example that I give is like, mm-hmm. I, I literally talk about our Tatum and it's mm-hmm. like, I think to me, like, I, I'm not surprised at that in the sense that like, not to say that it's not amazing and like mind blowing cause it is, but I guess I'm just so, I just kind of knew where it was going. I'm so desensitized yep. now. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, if you play our Tatum for, you know, 95% or 98% of jazz musicians, they're not going to be able to walk over and just play our no. Tatum back for you. This yeah. guy just, Oh, that's so nice. Bam. <laughs> I was like, Oh, you know, Right. And what do you, what do you think? Like, I, I really kind of was diving into this a lot lately of like how, you know, like what do you think it is that, uh, that makes, you know, in that culture, like growing up playing music like that and hearing music like that and being around it. It's like, I feel like the way, you know, the way we learn music, I guess in school is, you know, is cool. And it's great. Like, I, I think it's amazing. And you can go online and see all sorts of stuff. And it's like, but the one thing that I feel like isn't there is like that style of learning of like, you know, you, you, I play this and you play that and then, and then, right. and then we talk and then no, but what do No, yeah, but oh, okay. Okay. And it's like, no, we talk like that. It's, it's faster in the end. Once, once you, once your ear is, is dialed and you musically understand, because the thing is, is these people think like people think that they don't, musically know what they're doing or it's like no it, that couldn't be further from the truth like right they know it so well that they don't even it's kind of pointless that for them to read it's just like he can go over there and play art tatum he doesn't even know who he is but like he hears yep. it yeah and i mean and i mean you also have that other layer layer of gospel gospel musicians who do both i mean yeah so exactly right. it's not a necessity but there are people in the church that are great readers and of course and, yeah and man there's another thing i wanted to talk about louis and the same same thing is that there's a whole culture of older ladies who spoil those (laughs) spoil the musicians and give them love and even give them musical direction they're not even musicians and when i was young you know um again we're talking late 60s early 70s there were like secular analogs so I, i remember playing in clubs and it wasn't musicians all the time. A lot of times it was just patrons. Take your time, baby. If you're playing a solo and you're playing too much or, you know, some some aunt would let you know that 
you no, know, you're doing that wrong. Right. I mean, imagine. So on top of the musical lessons and that that kind of learning that you're talking about, you also have these kind of older people who care about you and and, and show their love mm-hmm. through through criticism sometimes, or or sometimes just spoiling you or whatever. And all of that I think contributed uh, and, and still contributes to like really superior music. Yeah, that's interesting. Your example, I really like that because that's that's something that you can't really. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to kind of grasp that. That's like a to put. You have to kind of. That's more. You're just around. You know, you're around, and you get these cultural influences of just being by your family and people you know in your community, and like, and like that is a real thing. I, that, that's it's a real thing. Th- without yep. a doubt, that's a real thing. Um, mm-hmm. One one person that kind of came to mind when you said um, both worlds. Because for me, it's like, I, I, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I just, I find both interesting, you know, and it's like, and I just kind of have accidentally stumbled into there, into that world, you know? And so like someone like, like a Corey Henry, I feel like is, is a great example of like the two different worlds kind of com- combining into one, you know, the, like I've seen, you know, videos of him where he just, he'll be sitting there playing Donna Lee or something and then he goes into some you know just the way he's playing you could tell it's like some churchy stuff and he's playing on organ or whatever and it's just it's interesting to see like I really like how the modern vision of a musician is kind of like it, it's becoming all those combined you kind of have to be you, and you can't help it like just by listening to popular music and whatever it may be it's like all those worlds it, it, it really is a melting pot you know it's like all mixed into one thing and I and I love it I think it's great it is great, but I mean, even you take an Aretha Franklin, you know, gospel and R and B icon. You know, I, I, you know, she's a Detroiter, so I can say that I, you know, I've touched her and talked to her, and and it, it just inspiring to be around someone on that level of kind of intimidating and inspiring at the same time. But you know, look, all the you know. Again, if you go early in her life, we're talking about still kind of a segregated environment. Mm. When black musicians came to town, they went to Reverend Franklin's house to hang. So so she, as a young person, heard Art Tatum, again, back to Art Tatum in the church, but he used to go to Reverend Fra- Franklin's and play. Aretha wow. Franklin was friends with John Coltrane. Yeah, so, see, that's... I mean, pe- people don't... People they don't, don't realize that... that- it was already like that. See, that's what, it yeah. It was already like that. See, and I, and, and I, I feel like I've kind of smelled, I'm like, I can tell, like it, I, it reeks of it. Like it's just, yeah, it yeah. makes sense. It's like, yes, this is great. I love it. Like it's just yeah. so cool. I mean, you know, Marvin Gaye is another super interesting example of all these worlds colliding. And if, if he were alive, he'd be in his eighties now. Right. But, uh, you know, he, he, as you know, he he really liked Nat King Cole and Sinatra and wanted to do that in a way more than the stuff he's known for. Mm. Interesting. Uh, there's an album called Vulnerable, which uh, which he you know worked on with a, with a lot of strings, and I think uh, some some of the people at Motown just kind of said, "Okay, Marvin, yeah, go ahead, do it," but they weren't they really wanted him to crank out another kind of pop hit, mm-hmm. you know. And he even got pushed back for recording um, what's going on. It didn't. It wasn't just uh, a smooth, smooth thing. Like, hey, let's do this statement. No, I mean, he he was a visionary. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but again, this this is this is people are a little bit more aware and less in boxes than we, than we typically think. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's great, man. Well, I can't wait to hear this Gregory Reporter new, like this new version of the t- of the tune. That's kind of how we went on this this whole church route. I, I'm really excited. I want to give you another crazy example of, okay. of how, of how, you know, how music. So I like the music of the state choir of Bulgaria. Uh, if you've ever heard like Bulgarian vocal music, it's one of the greatest vocal musics in the world. These people sing in seven and 15 and they sing seconds standing next to each other. And they're wearing like these traditional costumes and they're just killing just Mm -hmm. murdering you know but how did i hear about them milton nascimento the great Ah, brazilian singer told greg fillingaines michael jackson's musical director (laughs) to check out the bulgarian state choir and 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 greg told me 
right? Wow. But this came from a singer in Brazil, right? You know, not, noted for MEP Bé, right? And wow. and uh, you know, Brazilian popular music. So I, I think we're a little bit more aware of each other than we know. And you know, sadly, um, it's sad for anyone who's kind of stuck in their genre at any time. Even if you even if you continue to play in your your own whatever your style is, whatever your thing is. Be open. I'm just saying this to younger musicians who might want to listen to me. Be open to listen to, to everything, and also don't let anyone else de- define your aesthetic. I'm I'm saying listen to what you want to listen to. Mm. I'm not saying listen to what I think you should listen to. Right. <laughs> but 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 broad listening will not hurt you, no matter what you do. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think if anything, it's gonna help you. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not gonna hurt. So, I mean, and and go ahead and read and, and 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 take in art and you know don't don't be someone who can only talk about music if I can be that bold you know cuz nothing man when cats get around and start talking about reads and chord changes man I, it kills me you know I don't want to <laughs> so if, let me, if we were, if we were hanging I doubt that's what we'd be talking about no you know? I, I would agree yeah yeah so let me ask you what what is what do you think about this whole uh, you know, this whole digital revolution. And, uh, I mean, it's been here for a bit now, obviously, but I feel I, to me, it seems like we're on the cusp of another level, a new, of a new era of, of, you know, media of entertainment of, uh, whatever you want to call it, but of just the, the digital, like of literally what we're doing right now. I mean, we're having a discussion virtually, you know, Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think about, where it's where it is where it's come from and where do you like where it's going like i i don't know someone like you i'm curious what you think about the whole thing well what what i think is this that this is no different than than any time in history um technology always influences the way art is disseminated um be that you know recording uh be it the invention of the piano forte or you know what I mean so it's all so this is just what the technology is now and we're we're adapting to we're trying to catch up and be part of it and this is no difference uh different than the time when radio became available to everyone mm-hmm. it's, it is different but it's it's if we're talking about the impact of technology on art it's always been there this is nothing new right yeah so, i i kind of tend to think the same thing um I, I do find it interesting, though. I feel like the the mo- the modern take now is is especially unique and interesting to me because it seems like as we go on, I guess in this in this world, like um, in the music world or in the art world, whatever you want to call it, I feel like as technology progresses, it seems like the uh, the individual or the uh, the artist is being able to grab more of 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 the overall thing, you know, rather than having to uh, rely on other people, it seems like we're going to an era where, you know, you can kind of reach your audience directly and you can kind of do it on your own in a sense. You, you can, you can get your own team. You don't need like um, a a company or, or or some outside entity to kind of help you out. Whereas before you kind of did. So right. I, I feel like nowadays I that's what I find really interesting is that if I want to make a record I can make a record I can do it right here in my house I don't need anyone like, right no it, <clears throat> I mean it still presents a lot of challenges to people of your generation and following generations because exactly what you said is true and everyone's going to have now there's going to be this glut of music right. and creativity and it's going to be harder to like Get, to focus the attention on on individuals um and so man it, it presents its own like benefits and problems and challenges yeah i see yeah. what you mean yeah yeah interesting yeah i like i i've been i've been really following the technology i've been trying to at least as much as i can um just the whole technology uh boom you know you know with computers and interfaces and and new platforms and you know, all these different technologies. It, it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, you know, how it may play out and, you know, how, how to like kind of navigate it and kind of adapt like you're saying. You no, know, 
And another another aspect that I think probably doesn't get enough love is they don't cancel out like live playing in any way. Right. <laughs> like I I you know I'm glad you I, said that. <laughs> I use I use um you know a DAW to arrange. So when I when I do uh, sessions, usually um, I mean it depends on the artist. But for many artists, I'll do a mock up of how I want the rhythm section to sound, how I want the grooves to be, and I play it for the musicians. And I mean these are like heavyweights. People like Terry on Gully. You know, here I am like programming some drums for Terry on Gully. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but but they're like, you know, I'm glad you did that because that gives me an idea of what you it, want it, yeah what you want and so yeah i had the i had the technology to create a, a fairly nice track for the vocalist but i still prefer the sound of the of the live instrument but they're actually working together in that case mm -hmm. and not that you couldn't have you know electronic elements alongside um real element i'm mean, not real that's the wrong way to say it. acoustic elements is, is a better way to say it um I mean, there's, they don't cancel. Let's not be scared of this, folks. I mean, it's not either or. I mean, it, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> and I'm I, frankly, I'm shocked when younger musicians, like a, a younger musician from San Diego, told me his favorite song, and it was a it was a Thelonious Monk song, and I was like, but why? Why is that? You're mm -hmm. 17. You're 17. This is 2021. Why is that your favorite song? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, like Monk is older than my parents and I'm almost 70. So, I mean, I, I want young people to not be afraid to express their own, this is your time. Right. There's a thing, zeitgeist, man. Yeah. Move, it, move in your time. Yes, we, we love the past. We, I mean, we love, I mean, look, those people like Monk, uh, Coltrane, Sarah Vaughan, look, I thought those people were like uncles and aunts that I never heard because I heard their names at my house so much growing right. up. So I love their music and I love who they were and I've met a lot of their people. I hung out with Monk's son. I have one of Monk's, you know, I got a tie of his, right? And I'm really proud of it. You know, the son, Monk's son, T.S., gave me one of Monk's ties. That's cool. Um, but, but man, I, I can't say... It's still shocking to me that someone 17 would identify that way. Yeah. And it's not, it's okay to like respect and hear it and listen to it, but it, I don't think it should be your favorite song. I see it, what your point is. Yeah, I understand. There's something really, because if Monk had done that, if Monk in 1945, we're talking about. Yeah, he would have never no, done what, yeah. We're talking about, let's, let's do the math, man. Like if, if, if round midnight, a, appear somewhere of the mid 40s right mm -hmm. um how many years ago is that that's so 75 so years ago yeah so if monk in the mid 40s had been like his favorite music was from 75 years prior prior to that it would have been like stephen foster like i dream of genie with the light brown hair or something like that yeah, I see and you, what you're and you all would, you would have been like what monk is <laughs> monk like into stephen foster so but I know I'm going to get beat up for that. I know there are people, who, you know, uh, who think, um, I, you know, I'm going to go on record and just say that the tradition of the music is change. The tradition isn't like picking your favorite decade and sticking to it. Mm -hmm. The tradition is change. Yeah, I hear you. And I mean, my, my decade is, you know, I have my decade. I mean, yeah, the music of the late 60s and the 70s, you see... Herbie from 1974 behind me. They, yeah, that was my time, and I really hook up with that. Mm -hmm. But I'm yeah. not going to say everybody play that because that's the tradition. Right. Oh, no, I can't tell you that. It, it wouldn't, it, it's wrong. Now, I get what you mean. I think, that's a, I think that's a refreshing and realistic perspective to have, honestly, that most people, you kind of, you know, you kind of get told that uh, the opposite just by studying, you know, studying music and studying jazz is like, you know, you forget to kind of check out this. You forget like why you got into music in the first place. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it should be about communication and expression yeah. first. Yeah, I agree. And, and honestly, that's, I think going full circle, that's kind of what, uh, when I started playing my church gig, like you start, you start really 
feeling that when you start playing again with in that setting it's like oh wait yeah this is what like this is what i was you know this is what i like you know playing like this you know and so it's interesting i like how you said that though i mean i maybe you'll get some flack for it but i, I think it's great you're willing to go out and say something like that mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's I another mean, that's another thing that you kind of have a knack for is like you you know so many uh like artists that are are from like right now you know what i mean like i remember asking you know you asked me uh, a while back you know what are some artists that you're into i kind of gave you a list of people you're like, oh yeah i, I kind of know yeah yeah i've heard of that or and i'm just like well how does come out know these people like you you literally know everything <laughs> no uh, hardly but <laughs> but yeah i mean one of the things you know if, if i talk about some a, a group that inspires me now it's seba kopstad um and this is a um kind of a i don't know how to describe them they're they're neo soul soul elements uh, r&b elements uh it's two german guys and some singers from south africa and and swaziland and man this is seba s-e-b-a kopstad i think it's k-a-p-s-t-a-a-d okay i'll check and it out everyone everyone i mean and I, I when i hear that it's so fresh and it's just man i mean it's it's not my time i'm not going to roll out and imitate that because mm-hmm. again i'm i'm from another place and i i'm i've got to be true to you know what i hear and everything but I, i'm i'm still very aware of kind of newer trends and students are always like i spend a lot of time when i teach like finding out what students are listening to so mm-hmm. they're they're all and i learned that i learned about them from a student Dylan Diaz <laughs> told he's like check out Seba Kopstad. I was like, oh man. Okay, cool. Heck and yeah. through the magic of what you've been talking about, man, I heard that stuff. I reached out to the cat. Uh, the uh, his name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm not gonna think of his last name right now. Um, and he's in Stuttgart. And I I reached out to him on social media. And this is what I tell students: if music moves moves you. Try and contact the musician. Yeah, you'd be surprised. People, are, people are working in isolation, and they want to hear some direct feedback on how great they're stu- or whatever. Yeah, and, and man, he and I did like a a forty five minute Zoom <sighs> that was fantastic. That's so great. And what Sebastian told me, and this is again for the younger musicians that are l- listening, he has a, a record deal. Why he did this incredible music, incredible videos. He sent that stuff to a hundred and fifty companies and the 150th said yes and he got a good deal and they let him do what he wants and mm-hmm. all but that's yeah if you think your your work is finished when you do a nice recording if if you're trying to market yourself you're wrong right you got it and this is a great bass player visionary composer um he's and, got all the elements yep right yeah that's I love that you reached out to him and just, you had a little zoom meeting and like that, that's, that's so cool. You never could do that before. And now it's just, yeah. you know, at your fingertips, literally. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is they don't respond. Yeah. You know, that's happened. But, that's been happening to me. I've been, I've been reaching out to some people that, that I like that I kind of just only see on the internet, obviously, you know, they don't live here. So, and it's, mm-hmm. you know, and most of the time you don't, you know, you don't get a response, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's how, um, that's how I met Alicia Olatuja. Oh, okay. <clears throat> She has this incredible um, cover of human, Michael Jackson's Human Nature. Um, uh, That's with, a great song. Uh, with who's on there? It's Ulysses Owens. I want to say I, just a really superior group. I think her, maybe her ex-husband Michael was playing bass. And I was like, man, look, Alicia, I'm a fan, you know. And she got back to me. We went back and forth. I was playing it in class. I was making stu- I mean, classes that had nothing to do with <laughs> I, I just dug the music yeah for sure you know like everybody listen to this we're not talking about this today but right. listen to this <laughs> and uh so then uh she responded i ended up pulling her in she sings on take me take me to the alley she's that uh, second uh she's the second voice on okay. that song and, and then she came back and asked me to produce a project for her and that's the we did something called intuition songs from the minds of women Okay. Oh, we only okay. used uh, uh, female composers. Okay. And uh, uh, the results are really, really good. That's with Dana Stevens playing sax, oh. Jeremy Pelt on trump, um, who else? Um, Sullivan Fortner on piano, Ben Williams on bass, um, D- in- David Ro- Rosenthal on guitar. 
Nice. And Billy nice. Childs played one song. Yeah. Oh, Billy Childs. I love. I went down a Billy Childs rabbit hole for a while, like about a year ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, so it seems like you're always. I mean, you're always doing stuff. I know you teach at in San Diego, right? You're at UCSD. Yes. So I'm you, a t- teaching you, professor there. Okay, so you teach there, but I I feel like every time I talk to you, you're you're in some different state. You know, I, I, I travel because of uh, responsibilities with Gregory sometimes. Mm. And then um, I still have my roots in Detroit, and I go back there, and I produce a project there. Um, and then I, man, you know, through, um, again, uh, I went to uh, the Seoul Institute of, Ar- of the Arts in, in, in Seoul, Korea. Oh. Um, and through a student, again, you know, that's why these, these relationships like yours and mine, they're two-way. I, I don't want to... I don't want to be this old guy telling you. I, I learned so much from students, and people say that's a bogus thing to say. Well, it may be for some people. It isn't for, for me. Mm. And, and I've made incredible um, kind of business connections by taking younger people very seriously. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't set out. That's not the reason that I take younger people seriously. Right. Is at a certain point, I mean, everybody's on the planet a different amount of time, right? Unless you've got a twin or something. And so, so what? You know, I'm, you know, I'm 66 and th- there's a musician 14 and I go, well, what are you thinking about for the ending on this? <laughs> and they go, they roll out what their ideas. I'm like, yeah, I like that. I don't have any pro. I don't want to like do this lording over younger musicians because of my age i i can't stand it it's i i can't i, I can't stand it. i don't know how i got to that subject well how what was the well no i i think it was just because i was asking you about uh you know where you're always doing stuff and then you kind of mentioned that uh oh yeah you know, korea on, yeah yeah so one of my really favorite uh students from ucsd charles kim was doing some work for the Seoul institute of the arts and he pulled me in, and I did a virtual um, master class. Oh, cool. And one of the teachers there, um, a singer, because singers always like me, the person who <laughs> can't sing a note. But <laughs> singers, singers like me because I, res- I have so much respect for um, uh, singers and, and, and their musicianship. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, I, I don't like when music becomes a saxography or something like that or, or you know, like, like kind of, piano players and saxophone players are di- which I play both but we're not the only people in the in the discussion right and um and that's why in my classes I insist that drummers bass players uh singers learn all the same things that piano players learn mm-hmm. because th- they may have a, a they often have a greater comp- uh contribution or or maybe a less cliche way of thinking about composing then maybe maybe piano players maybe we've played sequences and guitar right. players we've played so many sequences that w- we get used to certain things yeah. well a singer or a drummer is not necessarily thinking that way and some sometimes their writing can be the most interesting for that yeah, reason yeah it's the most uh it, it's the most uh it, it seems like it comes creatively from from them they don't really have an instrument to get it out on so it's like mm-hmm. i see what you mean it's not as it seems more uh, i mean they're singing it you know you it's like yep you, you know that's the, th- the old thing you always hear is just you know play something like it's just sing it you know it sounds yeah, like well, that guy sounds like he's singing you know for certain aspects of composition is is the best for popular composition uh and i mean many of my favorite composers are are singers mm-hmm. almost a majority of them you know um you, you think about uh, milton nascimento from brazil um and and many many others um uh and and you realize that the voice you realize the the kind of primacy of of the voice yeah. and the importance of the voice, and I mean for for some ugly reasons, I think sometimes singers are kind of um, suppressed. Hmm. You know, there's there's gender issues. You know, you hear about the chick singer and yeah, that's and, true. And, and I, I mean, uh, happily, you know, you hear a lot less of that in your generation and 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 people younger than you. But um, some of this anti-singer bias comes from from gender bias, mm. and I I totally reject it. And you know, so I'll often ask you know sax players to sing something. So if you think singing is easy, right? That's great. I love that. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and sing the line instead. Yeah, 
you know, you, you're you going to do this mode, you know, sing it instead. Right. That's a, I, that that you know, becomes terrifying really quick. <laughs> right. Singing it. Singing is not that easy. So I I have a great respect for and that's why I end up working a lot with vocal musicians. Mm-hmm. So this in this vocal professor from Seoul, Korea mm-hmm. asked me to come there and and work with them. And when I got there, you know, they you know, some of the Korean musicians, um, they asked me about. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, some of the singers, and and Sarah Vaughan, and I said, "Yeah, okay." And they sang some, you know, some standards for me. I said, "Now, will you teach me some Korean music?" <laughs> and then everyone was like, "Whoa!" And we ended up doing only Korean music and no no jazz. I mean, I did what I do, and I kind of brought together traditional Korean musicians and the Korean jazz musicians, Mm -hmm. the Korean pop musicians in one setting. And they often, I mean, they're like two distinct parts of that school. Mm -hmm. But I was like, "Mm, no, let's not do that kind of jazz or whatever. So it was a a fantastic experience for me. Um, And uh, I I mean, I could live there. I mean, Seoul is just, it's what what an incredible place. Wow. What friendly people, Mm -hmm. you know. That's 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 great. That's a great story. I mean, it's cool to see uh what did they think what did they think about how you did that? Did they did they Well, the the professors were like you know, I said, you know, my you know, my country is, you know, not, you know, over just over 250 years old. Yours is like a thousand years. I think I need to be like learning something from y'all kind of. And every the professors were like, "Whoa." You know, (laughs) and they also they knew I wasn't saying it as a political, you know, just I wasn't doing that to to ingratiate them to me. I I felt it and I wanted to know and I was there to learn and I was there to hear their sound and eat their food and hang with them. And, you know, man, I, you know, I have. Can I share another thing? Yeah, of course. And I'm I'm, I'm here all day, however long you want. (laughs) I think it's cool how you did that, because I I feel like you gave them something that is they wouldn't have been able to get anywhere else. You know what I mean? Like they can go on and listen to Ella talk and sing and they can go study all the music and hear all the recordings and do it. like they, it's all there. Like it's all there. It's all there. Like what, I mean, you are going to go over there and just show them the same thing again. Like, yep. <laughs> so, and they're already doing it in, at, at a very high level. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So I want to show you. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Here we go. I love it. Yeah, that was great, man. I really love I, I love that. That was such a cool like 
uh, combining of two worlds. Right. And, and, you know, I didn't study Ponsori. That's the style that that is. And she didn't study jazz and we just rolled out. And I mean, first of all, she's considered her, her name is, um, professor, uh, professor park. And she, look, when you're on stage with somebody like that, you better, you better bring something, <laughs> you know, she's, she's amazing. She was 77 years old at the time of that recording. And, um, you know, uh, more or less it was unrehearsed wow. and I didn't, you know, we, we just played and she, I told her my father was in the Korean war and I, I told her the story and I told the, the students the story about how much my father liked, uh, Korea and the Korean people and how I grew up. My father even sang, uh, Arirang, which is a traditional, uh, Korean sound. Mm. And, um, anyway, I told him how, how much I thought Korea was part of my life. Cause my father always talked about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so right before we're, we're sitting in this kind of cold backstage area, she and I were getting ready to go out together and she just turns to me and says, think about your father. And we, cause he had, he just, he had just died. This is, uh, 2017 and I lost him a few years before. And, um, yeah, that, that was my instructions from her on that song. And that's what we played. Wow. Well, that yeah. was, that was a great clip, man. I could, I really felt that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, really and people cool. who are interested, please go to my YouTube channel and you can see some of these. Okay. Things. Yeah. Actually, I'm gonna, I, I'm not subscribed. I got to go check it out. What is, uh, how do I find it? Just to come out? Uh, is it ti- What's the yeah, title? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. Just under it. my name. Okay, nothing, perfect. Nothing special. Great. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. Um, well, if I'm holding you up, you know, don't feel free to, to bail on me whenever you need to. Uh, I could sit here and talk to you all day, so. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I'd like to maybe share uh, one other thing if I can find it cr- uh, quickly. Uh, something that you know very few people have seen okay. so it'd be kind of cool that your your audience gets to see it um uh let's see what's um what is some uh and while you're doing that maybe like what are some things that you're you're kind of into right now or that you can maybe hit me to that i i could go check out or um i mean it doesn't even really have to be music honestly well okay you know, I'm a I'm a fan of um, I I got into Scandinavian crime, okay. <laughs> crime novels. Oh wow! And I mean, I've been for many many years. I've been reading you know Scandinavian crime okay. from Iceland, from Sweden, and I love it. You know, I, I can't live without it, right? But I've kind of branched out to global noir fiction, uh-huh. and just recently I've been re- there's this series, and one of the one of the things in the series is Nairobi noir you know hmm. and um you know my name of course is from Kenya and i thought let me read some and there's short stories in that kind of crime mystery genre not just not only crime and that's what i'm i'm like now kind of obsessed because you know that series includes like detroit san diego wow. nairobi rio de janeiro havana tel aviv and they go uh, stockholm wow. and they go around the world and they collect the you know best short stories some of these people are like new york times contributors and you know it's it's really high level so everybody can if you just find nairobi noir which will be easy okay, then you sweet. can find the other ones that's cool know. but then the other thing i want to say again seba kopstad i'm okay. like i want to see in fact when you hear them please come back to me okay but, <laughs> but i want to see what you say about them. okay cool but yeah for sure they're really really good all right definitely so, so what I got up is um, um, something Gre- is Gregory, the chance I had to work with Gregory in London at Air Studios with Vince Mendoza as a conductor. Mm. Um, and uh, it's gre- it, this is just a recording from the control booth, you know, where I was working. Um, and and, and it's, no one's really heard this. It's from Gregory Porter's Nat King Cole and Me uh, project arranged by uh, Vince Mendoza okay. and featuring, um, you know, Christian Sands on piano. So you want to take a little listen to this? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Let's see. Um, here it is. Let's see.
is funny or it's sad or it's quiet or it's mad it's a good thing or it's bad but you Take a chance And if you fall, fall And I'm thinking I wouldn't mind Amazing, wow. right? Yes, man. I, it's that intro, the string intro. That just like it just like gave me Mahler vibes so much. It was great. Man. What a heavyweight! Gregory and I chose these songs, sent them to Mendoza. In two weeks, he had like twelve arra- fifteen arrangements. God, that I think. is amazing. <laughs> how did? How does? Do Do you know anything about like how do they do that stuff? Like how does? I would love to like I, I just wonder like listening to all those those chords go by it just it, it it just reminds me like of me staring at the organ player trying to figure out what he's playing. Man, Vince um Vince told me that his process is to choose an instrumentation. Okay. And then and then the the arrangement reveals itself. Wow. But I mean he's not operating on a, you know, he's a, he's not operating on a normal human level. <laughs> And you know what? He's got a son who's a piano player called Luca. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you know the alto saxophone player Dave Benny, mm-hmm. uh, 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 Vince's son plays with uh, Benny. He's like oh. in his early 20s, 24, something like that. And the apple didn't fall from the tree. Now, that's somebody else to check out. Luca okay. Mendoza, monster player. You know, that sounds familiar, actually, because I follow some of David Benny stuff, and I think I've seen that name. Yeah, that's his son. Okay, man. wow. And, that's you know that's uh you know it was a dream of mine to put vince mendoza and um and gregory together yeah and it happened i mean that's wow. why i i can't tell you why i'm not the most optimistic person but but what we do does involve faith when you when you choose a career in the arts for sure it, it doesn't have the timeline that maybe if you're if you're an engineer you know by the time you're 35 you're going to have this job and right. this Man, in the arts, it doesn't work like that. You got to stay afloat. I, I'm saying this to younger musicians. You know, dream big, keep floating for your real break to come. And um, I think I think that's how how things happen. Yeah. But yeah, I talked about Vince and the very first project I did with Gregory. It's called Water. When mm-hmm. we recorded that, I told his management, I was like, man, I want to hear Vince Mendoza and gregory and then it happened wow but not not because i mean it was like it was literally um uh it wasn't 10 years later maybe it was like seven or eight years later mm-hmm. but yeah that's great man wow it, yep that was wonderful i mean that and kind of what you're you know what you touched on with like uh a, a, you know trying to make it in the arts and just choosing that path it's like yeah you're right there is a certain amount of faith where you just you just gotta just step out you know and just keep going for it and 
you got to keep going and 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 then also sometimes you'll take a gig that you didn't want to take and maybe it's not the best situation but there'll be some ancillary benefit mm-hmm. to doing something that you thought you shouldn't do mm-hmm. and th- that's why i don't try to like guide myself like super hard anymore because things reveal themselves and, and man i'm the least like touchy feely uh, I, mean, I, I mean i'm not cosmic at all i don't think and yet just just life experiences taught me that yeah faith belief and you know and and there's got to be something to be said for believing in the people that you work with trusting the people that you work with good things will happen for you for yeah. all the young musicians who are checking out your your podcast well, that's you know it's it's funny you say it like that because I, I i kind of i feel the same way like you know there's been random moments where you know you just end up going to this place and doing this thing and you didn't really realize and you end up making this friend and the next thing you know it's a lifelong friend that and it's just like totally by accident it, it appears right. so you know but it's like it's almost like if you if you can get good at doing those kinds of things and it, maybe it's just being honest and just you know trying to live in the moment and just and you mm-hmm. love and you love it you know you love walking that path and it's like you you'd be surprised by how many how many times that kind of ends up happening in whatever right. way you know and right. I, lo- I love that stuff because it is kind of cosmic. Like, <laughs> yes, you know, it's like, way more cosmic than I am. And I can't explain it, but I've seen it enough times to to believe it now. Right. And I just I just want to I just want to encourage, you know, young musicians to, to keep keep dreaming because things happen. Yeah. I mean, Gregory was was my stu- you know, was, was in a class that I was subbing for at UCSD and the, all that stuff that's happened in his life. Wow. I mean, uh, we could have never predicted it. Right. You know, I, when I had him in the class, I said, "Look, come to my house, man, because you got a lot of talent. Let's let's do let's talk about life and music and repertoire and let's just see what happens." And right. Now look what happened. Yeah. I mean, I mean. <laughs> so it's a, it's it's real, man. I lived it, you know. Um, but I wouldn't have believed it. Right. And I wouldn't have predicted it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I get you. Well, that's well great, I better man. go. I have a I have a lesson coming up. Unfortunately. Well, thank thank you so much, Kamal. This was this was great, man. I really appreciate it, and uh, I love you know I love seeing what you're doing, and uh, I respect you so much. So thanks for taking thank the time out of your day and doing this. Thank you, man. And, and please edit that stuff and make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, man. Don't worry. Oh, okay, great. All Take right. care. See you. All right, bye now. Okay. Thank you.